Hello, this is Mac Whitkin with Scouting on Air, the first TV show by Scouts for Scouts. Today, we're going to look at Scout Dance Film Festival, take a trip to Jesse's Eagle Scout Project, cook with Tanner, and go to WNEM in Saginaw to talk with Cal Gillette, meteorologist and storm chaser. Scouts from across Michigan recently participated in the inaugural Scout Dance Film Festival at Camp Agawam in Lake Orion, during which patrols competed to produce short films. Each team received a character name, prop, and line of dialogue which they were required to include in their script. Beyond that, the youths were free to create any kind of Scout-appropriate film they wanted. Over the course of the weekend, some teams made comedies, others produced scary movies. One patrol even filmed a zombie flick. On Saturday evening, event organizers held a special screening of classic Universal monster movies. Because these films utilized practical effects which the scouts could now appreciate the time and effort that went into making them. The next morning, industry professionals, including local television producers and reporters, gave informational seminars to youth about career in the field. At the end of the weekend, scouts gathered at the nearby Oxford 7 Movie Theater for a private screening of the movies. After the judges deliberated, Troop 284 was ultimately named the winner of the festival. Now, let's take a trip to Jesse's Eagle Scout project. So today, I did my Eagle project. That's where me and all of my fellow troop mates, we came together to build some buckets to give to homeless people for when they move out of a homeless shelter and into a house. So an Eagle project is pretty much to finish off your career in scouting. It's the most important part. It's where you make a project, it benefits the community, and you bring everyone together to fundraise, and then you finally build your project. So I chose this for my Eagle project because I was working on a merit badge a couple years ago that was Citizenship in the Community Merit Badge. For that, you have to have service hours, and those service hours I got at the Lighthouse, which is making boxes to give to people that are less fortunate. You put food and necessary items, and then that's where I got the idea to give bu uh, buckets to homeless people. So becoming an eagle definitely it has been a goal of mine. It's very important because it helps you in the future with leadership skills, with outdoor skills. Uh, but it benefits the community because you have to do projects and you do volunteering, and also it looks good on resumes. <laughs> it's a lot of reason. So today, the most important part was that it went well. So it was quick, it was easy, everybody had fun, we had some nice pizza, and we got it accomplished. Now, let's go outside and cook with Tanner. Hello, my name is Tanner Langdon for Scouting On Air, and in today's episode's cooking segment, we will be making Dutch oven chicken pot pie. Chicken pot pie made in a Dutch oven is one of the easiest and best meals you can make for cold weather camping. It's simple, it's fast, and you get a warm, hearty meal in less than an hour and it takes little to no preparation. Here are our ingredients. First, we have a wide assortment of veggies. Now, we have both fresh and canned vegetables. You can use either, but we're using a mixture to show you how both can be applied. We're also using a little bit of oil and some minced garlic and thyme. In addition, for the pie crust, we'll be using biscuits. For the soup portion, we are using cream of chicken and cream of mushroom soup. And finally, for the chicken, we are using two cans of shredded chicken breast. The first thing you have to do is light your coals. Once you get that out of the way, the rest is, is pretty quick. First, you want to get all of your vegetables in the pot. If you are using fresh vegetables, now is the time that you want to use to cut open your vegetables. Once all your vegetables are ready to be in the, in the Dutch oven, uh, put all your vegetables in the Dutch oven with a little bit of oil and stir them around until they're just a little bit soft. Once they're soft, you can add both of your seasonings and keep mixing it in until it becomes aromatic and you can smell it. Once you can smell it, you can add the rest of your vegetables if you have any, but after that, you want to add all of your chicken. Once your chicken's in, you want to add your soups, both your cream of mushroom and your cream of chicken. 
Once everything is ready, you'll finally top it off with the biscuits and you will be good to go. Put the lid on and then put it on your coals and wait anywhere from 15 to 25 minutes depending on the weather and how hot your coals are. We'll come back when the pot pie is done. Once you can see that your biscuits are done and then your soup is starting to bubble, you know that you're complete. This meal is truly very simple. Anyone can do it. And if you follow these steps, you can have a great meal at your next camp. Night. This is Tanner Langdon for Scouting on Air. See you next time. My name is Mac Whitkin with Scouting on Air, the first TV show by Scouts for Scouts. Today I'm joined by Kyle Gillette, storm chaser and weather specialist at WNEM in Saginaw, as well as former scout. Kyle, what do meteorologists do other than just predict the weather? Yeah, well, the predicting the weather is um, a, a, a very difficult task when it comes to kind of relaying that to the public who isn't really sure if they want to just know what to wear or if they actually need the information. So for us, we're taking the science and the data and the numbers, and then we have to transfer it into a usable format for the people on air. So half of what we do is the forecasting. The other half of that is trying to figure out the proper way to communicate that forecast because I can be totally nerded out about something the storm is doing, but the person just cares about whether or not it's going to rain for whatever event they have or if, if there's gonna be snow on their way to work and stuff like that. So half of it's forecasting and predicting the weather. The other half is understanding your audience and figuring out how to relay that information for them in a way that's useful to them. Do you think that scouting influenced your career choice at all? Certainly. So uh, I think I was into weather before I started scouting, which was early, early on. But, um, you know, one of the big things about scouting is you always are taught to be aware of your surroundings and how to utilize your surroundings and the, the information that your surroundings are giving you. It's very important, uh, you know, when you guys go out and do things in the woods or, you know, stuff like that, you have to be very aware of everything around you. And weather is one of those great things where if you're not aware of what's happening at all times, everywhere, um, then you're not going to get the forecast right. So when it comes to scouting and thinking about the processes that make certain things happen like this thunderstorm, then you know you start to uh, realize the amount of information that you need to have. And scouting kind of brings in that aspect of being aware of everything because the atmospheres are fluid. So that means everything interacts with everything and without being able to understand how all of those pieces kind of play together, and you're never going to get a forecast right. So scouting really kind of teaches and um, ingrains that thought of being aware of everything and utilizing all the information. That you have. What is the most interesting storm you've chased? Oh, man. Try to keep it short and not just talk your ear off. Um, May 20, uh, 2017 uh, in Northwest Indiana was actually my first tornado. Uh, I lived uh, down by Jackson, Michigan at the time and we left uh, late morning, at, uh, I think it was like 10 or 11. We drove down into uh, North Central Indiana and we were there for uh, like six or seven hours just waiting for storms to develop. And uh, eventually the storms did develop as they moved from Illinois into Indiana. And then we had one storm uh, that kind of ramped up really nice and it dropped the tornado down and it was just a, a very beautiful storm something you'd expect out of like Kansas or Oklahoma where tornadoes happen all the time right uh, but this one was in Indiana and we were lucky uh, that there were not many storm chasers on this one not all the other storm chasers were in a different part of the state that day so we were one of the few that were able to see the tornado it was a very beautiful tornado and uh, it didn't really hit anything there was this one farmhouse that it uh, went by um, but it was out in the field and the only thing it did is it hit a little shed and it like took part of the roof off and it was very weak It didn't really do much damage and um, That was the nice thing, right? There's always chasing tornadoes because you like to see tornadoes or like to see the weather uh, But the other part of that is tornadoes hurt people and damage property So it's always nice to have a nice looking tornado that doesn't hurt anybody and of course it was my first so it really couldn't have been better awesome. So a lot of people complain about the accuracy mm. of the weather on, on news stations. Uh, what do you have to, to say about that and kind of why sometimes it may be inaccurate? Yeah, so uh, there's a couple ways to explain this. And number one is, you know, we're talking about tornadoes or uh, there's hail and lightning and snow. The fact of the matter is, is, you know, we learned a lot of what we know about modern meteorology in the 1960s when satellites came about. Modern tornado understanding didn't come about until the 1990s and the early 2000s. You know, that's not that long ago. And so you, 
what needs to be understood by people who you know get upset about that kind of thing i understand you know if we're calling for you know something to be dry and then a shower comes through like for a graduation party or something outdoors that that sucks but the fact of the matter is is we're on the very edge of science with the things we do and when it comes to the forecasting it's not even like you know you've got some uh, high level university that's out figuring out the edge of the science we are doing the edge of the science in the building when we're about to go on air so it's it's one of those things that it's very difficult to kind of grasp from a conceptual standpoint there's no real good way to calculate all of the things that we need to calculate to get a good understanding uh, one of the best ways to explain this is, you know, the only way for us to get a truly accurate forecast, no matter how good our computing is or how good our understanding is, is until we can observe every single molecule that exists everywhere on Earth. Because they all interact with each other and they are responsible for the processes that bring you the snow in your backyard or the rain uh, on your drive. And so when it comes to us being able to predict these things, we can't predict what we don't know exists. And so there's a, a barrier there that we're always trying to butt up against. And sometimes it ends up in, you know, the simple forecast where somebody's got something going on outside and it ends up raining when we say it doesn't rain or we're talking about big snow and then it ends up that the big snow is just further south than we thought. Those are things that we're battling and nobody does it on purpose. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it sucks that we're kind of, you know, in this position where we could let somebody down or have bad information, but you know, it's just the science is not there yet for anybody to have an accurate forecast. So much so in fact that even the computers that can forecast still are not as accurate as a human is because the computer simply can't handle the math. And so the human needs to be there to kind of interpret some of the information. It's just a very complicated thing. How do you apply the skills you learned in scouting to your everyday life? Yeah, so um, a lot of the things that came from uh, scouting back when I was in um, elementary school and in middle school. So like really early on was just the, like, you know, the pack mentality really that, you know, you guys are all in this together and uh, you're all kind of working towards the same goal, whatever that might be. And when it comes to, you know, forecasting or anything in life, um, it's understanding that you're not, you're not the only one out there and everybody else is trying to come towards some common goal. And uh, when it comes to you know, like working on the forecast, right, what we're trying to do is um, work together, me and the other meteorologists, to build that forecast. And, um, you know, of course, also going back to being aware of everything around you. And that's probably the biggest thing for me is, you know, sometimes there are people that can go without noticing things in life. And it just, it, it's just, uh, it's very interesting. You can tell sometimes who was able to go through scouting and who wasn't by, you know, uh, how aware people are of, of things in their environment that they can't use or can't use or their observations of things. And uh, so for me, that's probably the biggest one that I took from scouting is just being aware of everything around you, how you can use it and stuff like that. What do you think you would say to a kid considering joining scouts? Absolutely do it. Um, you learn things in scouts that you don't learn most other places. and. Besides the, the, the information or the facts that you learn from scouting, you learn other things uh, through those activities. So like when you guys go out uh, and uh, you do camping or you do hiking or you're doing some kind of project, stuff like that. Of course, you're learning something in that moment, but at the same time, you're also learning how to work with other people. And sometimes those are skills that are lost in other opportunities such as uh, you know just normal K through 12 school and stuff like that because you're learning information but when you're you know you know a, a Boy Scout troop what you're doing is you're doing all of these things together and so working with other people is one of the biggest uh, things that you could get out of scouting other than uh, the wealth of information if you encountered a scout who was interested in getting into meteorology what advice would you give them well for me uh, the biggest thing was first of all being open to the learning curve that comes with meteorology and there's a lot of math and stuff involved but it's very interesting stuff and uh it, you know learning meteorology is one of those things where you have to understand that what you're learning is you know the edge of science and uh theoretical and stuff like that so it's you know just be open to a new way of learning but also if you're trying to get started in weather or meteorology um for me the biggest thing was just finding like that first simple book like 
guide to weather or weather field guide, you know, you know, little books like that to get started. And then from there, it was just a lot of reading for me until I ended up going to college uh, for meteorology. But uh, just finding those little books, you know, ask ask mom and dad for a, cr a Christmas present. It's just like a basic, uh, you know, weather book. Um, that's how I got started. And from there, it just grew out of control, I guess you could say. What is your responsibility when reporting dangerous weather situations to the public? Yeah, so first and foremost, it's just getting the information out there. So, for example, if there's a, a tornado coming towards the town, the first thing is like, hey, you guys need to be ready. There's a tornado coming. And then, uh, you know, a lot of people get into a situation where they might start to panic because they're not sure what to do. Um, even though, I mean, you know, any situation in human life, when you start to talk about something uh, that's an emergency, even the most trained people will have that second where they're like, what to do? So uh, after telling them like, hey, there's a tornado coming, the next thing is like, here's what you should do. And it's, you know, for a tornado, you're talking getting to the lowest floor of a building, most interior room, that kind of thing. And then the next thing is uh, always having the most clear and concise information. When you're talking about a tornado coming through a town such as maybe Saginaw, well, Saginaw is a big town, and there's never been a tornado, as far as I know, in recorded history the size of a town like Saginaw. So you've got to be clear. Is it North Saginaw? Is it South Saginaw? Because you can have uh, people that might start to get really you know, uh, upset in, a, in a, a scared way, and they might not be in danger. So it's being very clear and concise about the situation and what people need to do. And then, of course, the next thing is to stay calm. Because uh, you know, for us on air, we're, we might not be in the path of that tornado, but we're still sitting watching maybe a tornado on radar going, this is scary, you know, because I know that there's people in the path of this and I have to sit there and tell them. So I can't get worked up. I can't uh, have any emotion. I just need to do my job that is um, telling people the information they need to know. And that can be a pretty tough thing, uh, especially when, uh, you know, you might have been forecasting all day and then you're on air for so long and then suddenly now it's happening and you can't let that emotion get through. You just got to be clear to the point, concise, and making sure that people are staying safe. Sometimes that's not always easy. Yeah, so the, uh, the process of the tornado warning or uh, we'll focus on tornado warning specifically, but any type of alert you get on your phone, that always comes from the National Weather Service. They are the only ones that are legally allowed to issue um, alerts like that. Uh, nobody else can issue tornado warnings or anything else. Um, so there's an interesting thing here where the tornado warning goes out and then if you ever hear the tornado siren, that usually comes from your local fire barn or um, there might be a township building that has the uh, siren. The siren comes from the emergency manager or a fireman or a police officer or somebody in that building. They flip the switch. So sometimes there can be a little bit of a lag there or the sirens go off without a warning because they thought they saw something. So it's a little bit of a, a miscommunication at times, but those warnings come out from the National Weather Service because they are the ones that are constantly looking at things and they have the authority to issue those warnings. So uh, when you hear the sirens, sometimes they go off during tornado warnings, sometimes they don't, they're not automated. They come from um, the, uh, the, the emergency managers or whoever's around for that particular county or town. So that's why we say that you can't rely on tornado sirens. Um, you know, tornado sirens are meant for people who are outside. And of course, in decades prior, more people were outside farming or in the woods or whatnot. And uh, now we've got more activity indoors. We also have cell phones. And so having a weather radio, a cell phone, a TV, a siren, having all those options available for you to get that information is probably the most important thing. Thank you for talking with us today, mm -hmm. Kyle. Absolutely. This has been Mac with Scouting on Air at WNEM Saginaw with Kyle Gillette. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Scouting on Air. This has been Mac Whitkin. <laughs>